As I sit here today, so many in what David Icke calls the mainstream alternative media are ignoring, for whatever reason, the clear connections between the likes of Donald Trump, Elon Musk, Eric Weinstein, Eric Schmidt and Peter Thiel to intelligence agencies and such cult assets as the Bilderberg Group. Peter Thiel, for example, is on the steering committee of this group. Thiel is, of course, a funder of Musk's SpaceX and an early investor in Facebook and the founder of CIA-affiliated Palantir. Any alternative media journalist cannot, in all honesty, support the likes of J.D. Vance or Trump, who are both funded by Peter Thiel, and hand on heart believe that these guys are against the so-called deep state. It's frankly ludicrous. We are also supposed to believe that Peter Thiel and former CEO of Google Eric Schmidt are on opposing sides of the US election when they are in fact deeply and directly connected through a group called America's Frontier Fund. America's Frontier Fund invests in domestic companies which align with their mission, which is the mission of the global cult. The non-profit AFF was founded by both Eric Schmidt and Peter Thiel. The intelligence links run deep into the AFF, with former head of InQtel Gilman Louis placed into the role of chief executive of the AFF. InQtel was a CIA-backed venture firm tasked with advising the CIA and other federal agencies on updates in technology. In May of 2022, Gilman Louis was named by Joe Biden to be on his intelligence advisory board. The fact is blatantly clear that both Biden and Trump are supported by those deeply in bed with either Eric Schmidt or Peter Thiel and the PayPal Mafia, or as I like to call them, the Cyber Satanists. But this goes deeper than just financial connections. Gilman Louis is also the chairman of the Federal of American Scientists. The FAS was originally funded in 1946 by many scientists who were part of the Manhattan Project. Semiconductors and nuclear energy are central to this cult. Columbia University once stored a particle accelerator in its underground tunnels. This was then later used in the Manhattan Project. Footage from this project was produced in Hollywood at the secretive Lookout Mountain. These particle accelerators are used at CERN in Switzerland, where many believe they are being weaponized to open up portals into other worlds. I believe this tech is to be used at the newly built Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. The Habad Lubavitch Messianic sect even described the temple as the following. A gateway or interface between heaven and earth. The temple itself, with all of its chambers and accoutrements, is a kind of resonance chamber or amplifier, as well as a broadcaster of the system to the rest of the world. This was a direct quote from the Habad Lubavitch website. This is the same agenda of the likes of Putin, Netanyahu, Zelensky, Malay, Donald Trump and RFK Jr., all of whom are connected to the Habad sect. There are very few journalists in the alternative media connecting these dots, and Derek Bros of the Conscious Resistance is one of them. Derek joins me for this week's Classified as we uncover how the likes of America's Frontier Fund, Peter Thiel, Eric Schmidt, Elon Musk and Donald Trump appear to connect into this New World Order agenda. Hi guys, welcome to this week's Classified here on Iconic.com. I'm here with someone I haven't spoken to for a good couple of years, but you'll know him, Derek Bros of the Conscience Resistance. Um, we'll be talking today about the American Frontier Fund, something that I hadn't heard of, even though we do this research um, until very recently and actually until Derek brought it up himself. So Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Well, as one of the very few people that have calling this down the line at the moment, we see all these people galvanizing, unfortunately, around the Trump train um, and more and more people keep jumping on it. I've seen in the last couple of days, Peter McCullen jumping on it. Um, I've seen um, Robert Malone jumping on it. 
And I've seen, obviously, we have the likes of Alex Jones and we have um, RFK Jr. now combining. And it's it's uh, it's quite clear to see that this thing is kind of coming to an ahead. But one of the main names that come up again and again is Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel is connected to Eric Schmidt. And that's who we'll be talking about today. Because technically, if you're looking in political terms and you still believed in the divide, they should be enemies. But they're not, are they? They're connected through this um, American Frontier Fund. So what is the American Frontier Fund? Yeah, absolutely. And it's been quite crazy to watch what's going on. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to write this article, because, um, you know, I feel like people like yourself, me, obviously, David Icke and others who've been around for quite some time. If you were to tell people that uh, somebody had a connection to the Bilderberg Group, it might raise some red flags, you know, for example, or even if, you know, OK, they attended one meeting. Let me go ask them. Let's dig deeper into it. But if you were to say that somebody was a steering committee member of the Bilderberg Group, that would definitely raise red flags. You definitely say, OK, wow, they're, they're connected to some shady people. Maybe I should be cautious and skeptical of them. Unfortunately, it seems that like in the current media alternative, or as David calls it, the mainstream alternative media space, so many people are choosing to ignore those connections, as well as connections to the Zionist Israeli lobby. And we see both of those connections with these men, Peter Thiel and Eric Schmidt. Uh, Eric Schmidt, for those who are unfamiliar, he's the former CEO of Google, also been heavily involved in uh, US politics in the Trump administration and the Obama administration and the Biden administration, specifically regarding artificial intelligence. And then Peter Thiel, of course, he's the co-founder. Uh, he goes back to PayPal and what they call the PayPal mafia, but also the co-founder of Palantir. Palantir is, of course, this private intelligence firm that received their you know, $2 million in the beginning from the CIA's venture capital firm, Enquitel. So you know, the, the short version is you've got a lot of swampy creatures here who are all interconnected. And as you said, on the surface level, on the surface level, they're opposing sides. You know, Eric Schmidt is going all in on Kamala Harris, as well as some of the other more, at least what we're being told, left-leaning um, Silicon Valley tech guys. They're going with Kamala Harris, including Alex Karp, who's also a co-founder of Palantir. He's also a steering committee member of the Bilderberg Group. So they're going for Harris. And then on the other side, we've got Peter Thiel, who again, Palantir, Bilderberg Group, et cetera. He's been supporting Donald Trump since 2016. Peter Thiel actually helped Donald Trump's uh, VP candidate, J.D. Vance, helped him win his Senate race in 22, uh, 2022. I think he donated $15 million to help him win that race. And then uh, he continues to support J.D. Vance. He continues to support Donald Trump. So on both sides of the equation, you've got these uh, opposing, allegedly opposing forces. But as I mentioned, both kind of coming back to the same, same support group, Bilderberg group, Zionism, et cetera. And as I was digging further into these different connections, I came across this America's Frontier Fund and I hadn't seen anybody else writing about it. And I do think it's important for us to sort of, you know, uncover these various pieces of the puzzle. As you know, the, there's so many, it's such a big web, right, of, of different connections and relationships. And more people are familiar with things like the World Economic Forum, even the Bilderberg Group. But there are a lot of these lesser known institutions, nonprofits, think tanks, allegedly philanthropic outfits that are also playing a role in the puzzle. And, and I think it's important for us to know their names so that when we see their names pop up in the future, you know, we can raise an eyebrow and say, OK, I remember hearing about these guys and who they're connected to. Maybe I should be skeptical of you know, whatever they're involved in. And so that was my goal with writing this article. Uh, so the America's Frontier Fund, it was actually founded in 2021 and really started getting some uh, boost in 2022. Uh, and just to kind of give a little bit more background, as I mentioned, the Eric Schmidt was involved in this AI commission. It was appointed by Donald Trump in 2018. So it was the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, or just known as the AI commission. And it, basically the goal was for uh, these big tech folks, because you had people from Oracle, from Facebook, a lot of the big tech companies involved in the AI commission. And Eric Schmidt, again, former CEO of Google, was the chair of it. And so for three years, they were putting out reports. And in uh, early 2021, they put out their final report and the commission was, was disbanded. And one of the things that they talked about in, in their final report was that there should be some new organization or some sort of institution which could kind of bridge the gap between public being government and private institutions, corporations, et cetera. And of course, this is what we hear a lot with the World Economic Forum, public-private partnerships, um, stakeholder capitalism, et cetera. 
And so the AI commission made this recommendation for a new organization to come about that could bridge the gap between the government and between the private sector, particularly with AI and other 5G, 6G, et cetera, all these type of tech. And that is what America's Frontier Fund has become. So, I mean, if you even look at that, the fact that they had these uh, CEOs of big tech companies appointed to this AI commission, and then they make a final report saying, hey, we should create this new organization that plays this special role. Well, then Eric Schmidt goes on to found that organization to be himself in that role. And uh, it was founded by him with with funding from him and Peter Thiel. So again, that connection coming back to these two folks. And as I point out in my article, if you visit the America's Frontier Fund website, you actually don't see Peter Thiel or Eric Schmidt on the website at all, which I think is being done on purpose. Um, but you see people who are directly connected to them and indirectly connected to them, including people who are, are like the current CEOs who worked with Eric Schmidt at um, his own nonprofit uh, philanthropic organization, Schmidt Futures, um, and several people who have worked with him on the AI commission. It really is the kind of thing that honestly, I think I need to make a mind map of it because there's so much overlapping between like, okay, these folks were on the AI commission with Eric Schmidt. Now they're working for America's Frontier Fund. This person worked for Google. Now they're working for America's Frontier Fund. This person came from Palantir. I mean, it, the connections are extensive um, as you as you dive deeper into it. And as I can share more on, we also have the connections from America's Frontier Fund with the CIA and with their own venture capital firm as well. I absolutely want to get into the CIA connections because it's my belief that the alternative media is absolutely riddled with um, intelligence. And in, in of itself, and I'm not talking about everybody because like the mainstream media, everybody's not going to be involved, but I do think it's an intelligence operation in itself. And I think we have to come to terms with that, that it has that ability to, you. why would you, if you would fund both sides like they do. Gilman Louis is mm. someone that I want to speak of because he's the he's now the CEO of Frontier Funds. He was famous for his role in um, InQtel. Now, InQtel is very famous for being a CIA venture capital firm. Can we talk about him? And something I did just find out, only just before I, we started doing this, He's involved with something that goes back to um, a, a situation where um, he's involved with something called the Federation of American Scientists. I don't know if you've heard of this, mm -hmm. but it's actually that was funded in 1946. Things seem to happen around by 1946, 1947. But it's actually involved some scientists from the Manhattan Project as well. So we're going back a oh, long wow. way with these people, aren't we? Gilman Louis. Absolutely. Bella. Yeah, Gilman Louis. So as you said, he's he's most infamous for formerly being the head of the of NQTEL, which is the CIA's venture capital firm. And I for those who aren't even familiar with that, this might sound like an odd idea, but this is the state of the affairs where it's really hard to tell the difference between government and corporations. There's a revolving door that is just, you know, it's constantly revolving because they go from one to the other and back and forth. And I think he's an example of that. And, you know, let, let's try to give the most charitable take that we could, right? If we lived in a, a world, a utopian world where we didn't have these psychopaths, sure, maybe if you were to create an organization that was going to be focused on AI and all these different technologies, you would want people who have expertise in those fields, right? That, that makes sense. It's not hard to understand that. Unfortunately, it's a bit deeper than that. You know, the, these relationships, as I call them in my article, I think they're kind of incestuous because they, they, have, they, they know each other in these other areas and then they come together in new organizations. Uh, and in this case of America's Frontier Fund, most Americans don't even know this thing exists, um, even though I think it's going to become increasingly important in the coming years. But Gilman Louie, he is one of the people I was mentioning who comes from the NQTEL background. He also has several different connections to uh, Eric Schmidt. And just a little more about NQTEL for those who don't know. So again, the CIA, they've got their own money, which is, of course, stolen from taxpayers. And they use that to invest in all kinds of big tech companies. But really what's going on and what many of us have speculated and believed is that when they see a company that is maybe starting out, maybe they've got a good idea or a good technology, the CIA will inject money into their project. And then, of course, along with that money, they usually bring various officials and, and they have some role and some say over that. We don't really truly know all the details, unfortunately, but that is what appears to be true. And for example, there was a company... Um, called Keyhole Inc. back uh, in the early 2000s. And Keyhole was funded by NQTEL, by the CIA. We don't know what the fund, that the amount of uh, funds they gave them, but we do know they received money from the CIA. And then eventually Keyhole Inc. became what we now know as Google Earth. 
And so it's just a very obvious example that the CIA can inject money into different companies. Those projects can then either go on to grow and become big companies like Facebook. There's also some questions about Facebook and the connections there because we know that the U.S. Department of Defense had a project called LifeLog in the early 2000s, which was very similar to what we know as Facebook now. And they talked about being able to map human relationships. And for folks who remember the post 9-11 years, uh, the U.S. government tried to um, – in tried to pass this organization, bring about this um, government agency called Total Information Awareness and this program, which literally the logo was the pyramid with an all seeing eye looking over the world. And, you know, just to kind of give you an example of how much things have changed, this was 22 years ago, 23 years ago. At that time, people were still aware of privacy and their liberty. So there was a lot of public pushback and they had to publicly close down the Total Information Awareness program. Of course, it never really went away. They just sort of broke it apart and brought it in through different ways. And, and pretty much they've achieved that goal, not only through government programs, but effectively through social media and by people logging their locations and checking in places and things like that. So it's important to understand who Inkutel is because we're, we're pretty certain that much of the major big tech companies have relationships with Inkutel, whether those are public or private uh, relationships we don't know about. And mostly that's in the form of money. Like I mentioned that Peter Thiel's company Palantir had received two rounds of investment from NQTEL totaling 2 million US. So when NQTEL gives money to a company, typically it indicates that there is a relationship there with the CIA and with uh, that company. So we, we need to be concerned about that. I mean, we need to be, this is why of course, raising the alarm bells about Peter Thiel and all these different connections are important. Um, but as far as Eric Schmidt and the America's Frontier Fund and NQTEL, as I mentioned, as you talked about, you've got um, uh, Louis Gil, uh, Gilman Louis, who's the, the, the fund CEO. So he goes from being the head of NQTEL to now being the head of America's Frontier Fund. But there's also some other connections that I'll, I'll point to as well. Uh, there's a company called Sandbox AQ, which was an AI company that also received money from NQTEL in 2022. Well, Eric Schmidt is the chair of that company as well as an investor in that company. Uh, you got Steve Bowser, who's the president of NQTEL currently. He also was involved in helping sell this Sandbox AQ uh, AI technology to the U.S. government. So again, like I said, I think I need to make a mind map because the, over, the overlaps are just is pretty intense and, and it gets difficult to follow. So I understand if people hear the different names and connections and it, it might be overwhelming, but the, the broader point here is that these relationships exist. The American people, the people of the world really have no idea. And these aren't just small companies. We're talking about AI companies and we know how important AI is going to be for not only just how they're trying to transform the world, but for the technocratic agenda that they're trying to bring in for getting people into transhumanism and getting people into AI and uh, the metaverse and things of this sort. So when the CIA is investing in, in companies that are working on AI, when Eric Schmidt is going into the US government and the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration focused on AI and developing AI policy. And as I pr uh, pointed out in one of my previous articles, not only that, but Eric Schmidt is deeply tied to the US military. He went and toured hundreds of US military bases and basically told them that all of their stuff was out of date, but that he was gonna help get them upgraded via his connections to the big tech companies. So you're really seeing this merger of big tech U.S. intelligence and the military industrial complex. And of course, we already know that uh, companies like Google, as well as Palantir, are using AI for programs like Lavender in Israel to track down and, and murder people and, and drone bombs and things of this sort. And the fear, I, I'd say, for many Americans who are awake to these agendas is that in the long term, these same technologies are going to be turned around and used on Americans and used on people all around in the world to track those of us who speak out and to, I mean, they're already doing this, but at a level that we can't even imagine with artificial intelligence built in and Eric Schmidt and uh, America's Frontier Fund, Peter Teal, Gilman Louie, these individuals are, are in, intensively involved in this. And another point I'll make that maybe is kind of lower on the totem pole in terms of our concerns, but I think it's still just, even if you look at it from just a super mainstream perspective at the most basic level, what we're witnessing here and what's happening with America's Frontier Fund is a lot of conflicts of interest and a lot of corruption. So uh, just one example, in 2016, the Wall Street Journal, they reported that a numerous individuals who are working for NQTEL are also 
invested in or working for companies that InQtel invests in. So they're kind of double dipping, right? They, you know, Eric Schmidt's the perfect example of this. He'll have his uh, investments in some big company. And then again, he goes back, he's working with the government and he tells the government, hey, we should invest in that company, right? So even if you're just talking about it from the most basic level of corruption, conflicts of interest, funny money, there's a lot of problems and a lot of red flags there. But unfortunately, it goes even deeper as we're, we're talking about here with intelligence connections and with uh, military industrial complex connections. I think a really important point that you brought up there was that the technology is already there. And I think from my personal take on it is that, that the technology is already there. They're tracking the trace and everything. Not only that, we're giving our information up to them anyway. Um, but it's not acceptable to do so in the Western world yet. But it's becoming... They're, they need to get that acquiescence from the public that it's acceptable to do these things. And then you look at things like you just pointed out some of the technology that they had to track and trace things from Israel, but they're allowed the Hamas somehow got in. It's absurd to think that these things aren't allowed to, to happen. And sure. the cognitive dissonance there, it amazes me. I, I wanted to bring in Elon um, Musk in this because people from the general public will go, oh my God, he's the richest man in the world. We clearly know he isn't Saudi Royal um, funded um, Qatar national funds. Peter Thiel funded. But so if you've got Eric Schmidt there, who's in QTEL um, um, attached, and they're funding Palantir, but Palantir then, Eric, um, Peter Thiel is then funding Musk. There's a hierarchy here, and Musk's quite low down on this hierarchy by the looks of it. Then underneath them, you've got the likes of Trump, and then you've got the likes of JD Vance and RFK. I mean, there is a hierarchy here, and the ones that people are thinking that are at the very top are, are nowhere near. Am I right in saying? Absolutely, 100%. And um, I, I think you're you're pretty accurate with that. I mean, Musk to me has always been more of a, um, uh, he's an archetype, right? He's a character that they brought in. I mean, to me, the most obvious example of this is in the, in the, the, uh, the Marvel movies, right? The Iron Man movie, they literally put him in there as, you know, Tony Stark. Like, and I think that was meant to, as you know, cast the spell on people and say like, look, he's the Tony Stark of our world. He's the billionaire, you know, flamboyant playboy that's here to, you know, uh, save the world. So they, they put him in the, in the movies so that people can kind of make that connection. Uh, and then of course, you know, one of the, the layers of deception that I've been pointing to in this, what I call the great inversion, which is putting people like Musk and Tucker Carlson and Trump, obviously, and RFK now, and elevating them to this level of they're the resistance, they're fighting against the deep state, uh, is to have the media attack them oftentimes for just garbage, you know, for things that aren't really relevant. Like the media doesn't go after Trump or, um, or uh, Musk for supporting and funding war you know musk's starlink are making the russia and ukraine war possible for just as one example he's obviously promoting brain chips and transhumanism and and uh his, his agenda lines up pretty well with the world economic forum he just promises it's going to be something different but if you have this situation where the average person or even the average truther who maybe doesn't have all their critical thinking skills still intact they look and, and i have seen this i'm sure you've seen the same responses like what do you mean Trump's a bad guy? They're literally attacking him. They're, they're talking crap about him in the media. And I've seen people say things, the same thing with Musk, like all the right people that I hate are attacking him. So that means he must be a good guy. Like it's just this so simple lack of logic that I, I can't even believe that, that we're witnessing. But I hear these responses on the daily basis. And, and then part of that, of course, is getting Musk into this position of uh, buying um, Twitter. And, and then, of course, people are like, yeah, we, we've reclaimed Twitter now. We got it back from the leftists, from the, the censorship and all the, you know, the Democrats, et cetera. And of course, there were bad things going on Twitter before. But anybody who thinks there's no censorship or shadow banning going on under Musk is just not paying attention. So but it creates this illusion that we, the, the freedom movement, the truth movement, we're winning. We're now in control, right? We've got Rumble. We've Even though Rumble is funded by Peter Thiel and there's a lot of shady connections, I've pointed that out recently as well. Um, people connected to PayPal, people connect, you know, the, all the same characters getting on the, the board of Rumble, funding Rumble, et cetera. People ignore that. And it might be censorship free for the moment, but I, I don't think it'll stay that way long term. But the point is, you've got the we've got Rumble now. We've got Twitter. It's a free speech platform. And Elon, Elon Musk is fighting, you know, for us. And he's even saying he might take a position in the Trump cabinet. And you're really starting to, to see this uh, um, 
the faux Avengers being formed to, to continue the Marvel now uh, metaphor here that the Musk and uh, Trump and RFK and that now Tulsi Gabbard is getting in and she's endorsing and all the usual characters, Tucker Carlson and others. And I do believe that this is the great inversion. This is moving from darkness to false light. Now, anybody with eyes and ears can see how crazy the the left uh, the alleged left the the progressives around the world have become everything from censorship to pushing transgender stuff to just all kinds of things that you don't even have to be an awake person just an average person and you look at that and you're like that seems pretty crazy i don't i don't i don't align with that i don't fit in with that so then what do people do then they see but these guys seem to be saying some truth so maybe this is where the real answer is maybe the answer is the right wing now and conservatism and it's just swinging you know from one side back to the other but so many people are being convinced that this is the real awakening. And of course, I would also point to things like the whole QAnon conspiracy stuff as part of that PSYOP that got many people to this point. And unfortunately, there's still people who believe that that's, that's a thing, um, even to this day after all the time and all the broken promises. I mean, I think we really are, man, like in... Um, there, there's a spell, there's a magic, a huge spell going on. And it, we've always known that, but it kind of felt like, well, those of us who are aware and asking questions, we see past the two party illusion. We understand that this is all garbage. And I mean, you can go back to, uh, in terms of the United States, George Bush, Tony Blair, right? You go to Obama, you go to the people saw through that people could clearly see okay, well, Obama said he was going to do something different and now he lied and we already could see the Goldman Sachs connections and other things. And then Trump came along and I really think he broke a lot of people's brains. And I don't even mean just like the left people who attack him for silly things and scream racist constantly and this and that. Like, I do think Trump is an authoritarian. I think that is a, he's a dangerous person, not necessarily for the same reasons that the mainstream calls out. But again, you see this response where people, they become desensitized to it after the media attacks Trump, attacks must so often, so long for things that turn out to not be accurate or not be true, or at least not completely true the way that they were presented. And then people lose faith in the corporate media, which again, we would be the kind of people to celebrate, but it's done on purpose. So then the new mainstream alternative media can step into place and present themselves as the true arbiters of what's factual and we're the real ones defending it and then meanwhile i think those of us who have been consistent are now being called black pilled negative we just don't understand what's going on i mean it's it's an incredible psyop that we're witnessing and uh, i'm glad we're making time to, to discuss this because you know it's it, i think this is just such a crucial time to really those of us who can see what's going on still to be coming together and rallying together and trying to you know boost the signal for each other's work and for each other's message to make sure that not all of our audiences are bought into this because i mean I, I'm, I'm sure you've been getting the same thing as i have brother like i've been getting amazing level of pushback over the last week just the last few days like particularly since rfk announced he's joining trump's team but even you know going back to a few weeks with this alleged assassination attempt and trump basically being made a god in some people's eyes like this is at least in my perspective, a level of propaganda that we haven't seen in quite some time. And, and I think it's very worrisome, but it's also why it's so important for us to talk about it. It absolutely is. And it's disappointing as well. I don't know how you feel about it. I'm sure maybe you feel the same, but absolutely. I'm really disappointed in the likes of Alex Jones. I, I am. Um, he's done some great stuff. Maybe it's because I got him over a barrel and he's obviously he's in billions of dollars of debt that wouldn't surprise me russell brand obviously was that a hit job in my opinion documentary came out and got him over a barrel he was basically given a home at rumble when obviously now he's having to in my point pay the piper pretend he's christian it's nonsense in my opinion because he's he's a comedian where's the comedy gone in it um what do you think the the, the level of of religion has been absolutely weaponized here in my opinion and you've got trump who is attached through jared kushner to the habadnik um sect yeah. um which is a messianic sect you've got jfk as well rfk sorry as well um although joseph kennedy was was attached to them um you've got um Millet, you've got um putin you've got putin and zelensky by the way both in their pocket like this group of messianic you would say jewish but i would say sabbatean um mm -hmm. cabalists right in the center of this but they're put on a christian front this this the, the likes of trump the likes of brand so there is a weaponization here of especially christianity um and i see a lot of the alternative media 
being dragged in through that way, especially in the US, because that's always been primarily a kind of Christian kind of movement. Do you see what I see? Absolutely, man. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would second all the names you mentioned, and also mention uh, people like Jordan Peterson and others who are all of a sudden just having some conversion out of nowhere. I mean, I, I've definitely been extremely skeptical of what I've witnessed with Russell Brand. And I'll mention when I was at um, one of the articles I wrote a few weeks ago about Rumble, I went to this Bitcoin conference in Nashville, and it was being sponsored by Rumble, and Russell Brand was there as well as the CEO of Rumble, and I did talk to Russell for a moment. And uh, we exchanged information. Um, I doubt I'm going to end up getting on the platform because of all the things I'm calling out. But I, uh, you know, in person, he seemed like a genuine person. I tend to believe that, like you said, they probably got him over a barrel with the, the hit job documentary and who knows what other kind of dirt there might be. I don't, I, you know, and I hate to say this because I, people can are free to believe whatever they want. And I, and I, I think that's a fundamental human right, of course, even if I think people are deluded in their beliefs. Um, so I say that first to say, I don't buy for one second that he is a Christian now all of a sudden. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I just don't believe in these conversions that we're witnessing. Uh, and especially in the cases of people who, uh, Jordan Peterson, for example, were like, I'm very logical, I'm an atheist, et cetera. And then we're kind of witnessing through the, the public uh, channels a transformation, or at least that's the message that we're supposed to get. And the same thing with the Trump assassination attempt, you know, Trump has never been, and nobody would ever consider Trump to be some strong Christian or some, you know, man of God or anything like that. Like you look at who he actually is and he's very far from that, but yet even he will sort of pay lip service to that. And of course you mentioned the Jared Kushner thing and, and, and there are plenty of people now who I think maybe would have been on the fence or even, uh, been against Trump, who now, because they see this protected by the hand of God and prophecies predicted this and all kinds of stuff. And like you said, these, these are folks that are coming back from a, from a messianic uh, background. And so they want prophecy to come to life. They're trying to will prophecy into life, whether or not we believe those prophecies are, are real or not, they want them to come to life. And so they're doing everything they can. And this is why, of course, the, the, uh, uh, the Zionist lobby is so part of it. Uh, and and part of what they're doing in Israel, and I think Trump is the one that, that has been ordained to bring about this, whatever vision they have, whatever prophecy they have. But I absolutely see. I mean, personally, I've always think that religion has been a tool for controlling and dividing and manipulating people. I do believe in a creator. I believe in a creative divine force. But I definitely think the Abrahamic religions have been extremely problematic for humanity and continue to be, and they continue to be exploited and played off of each other. And I, I think that's by design. And uh, this is why it actually the one of the final episodes of my documentary series, The Pyramid of Power, uh, is going to be focused on religion and secret societies. And I'm sure it's going to upset some of my audience and folks because I'm going to dive deeper into that. But I, I think, as you know, a lot of these people who portray themselves as Christians or Catholics or even Muslim or other things in front of the cameras are very much not those things and they're involved in other types of beliefs and you know whether that gets labeled satanic or luciferian or other things the point is they are not what they claim to be and they use those uh religions and and the sort of veil of what those religions are supposed to be in the best case scenario as a way to mask their true intentions and their true agendas and goals they do. I mean, I, I've been labelled a Gnostic many, many times, and that's not something I even subscribe to. I look into all different things, especially by, I won't mention names, by a Christian who does this sort of work, um, who's been labelling people who just disagree with anything that, that InfoWars is putting out at the moment, um, that they're Gnostics, and that's apparently a bad thing, um, although... The only reason is that we know... Jay Dyer? Yes, it is, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but the only reason, like, they... Actually, what we know about the Gnostics is mostly written by the Christians anyway, as you wouldn't write nice, nice things about your enemies. So, um, mm. you know, it doesn't make sense. But, you know, you just think, oh, come on. Um, we're, we're grown-ups here. We're trying to work this out. But people like yourself, people like Ryan Christian, um, Whitney Webb, obviously, Jay... Um, uh, Jay Ike and, um, and uh, Gareth and there's many others that I can't get at the top of my head um, are still trying to see this right down the, mid the middle but when, when you look at this messianic thing and I keep coming back to this in Qatar we had Jared Kushner at a football game with Elon Musk now you would think what is Jared Kushner a messianic Jewish faith person doing in Qatar with the guys from the national 
fund and what is Musk doing there? What do you think is going on here? Because I still think this this AI technology is going to play a huge part in the performance of a messianic agenda unfailing. Absolutely. I mean, so uh, two things come to mind there. Uh, one, which I need to do some more research on and, and you're, you're uh, piquing my interest and that is the Qatari influence. I mean, I've, I've heard more and more about that and just their, their wealth and their funding of different uh, people and organizations. That's not something that I can claim to be super uh, versed on, but I definitely think that you're right to, you know, your instincts are right, that there's something going on there and something that we should uh, dig further into. You know, what you make me think of, though, in terms of the role that AI will play in some sort of uh, messianic prophecy or, or vision, which I think we are probably marching towards, is this old, uh, this old theory called Project Bluebeam that I know you're familiar with. And it, it reminds me of that because for, for those who aren't familiar, Project Bluebeam was this idea that was first promoted uh, in the early 90s. And it's kind of just stayed in the background. But the general idea being, there's variations on it, but the general idea being that uh, these uh, predator class, these um, folks would stage some sort of alien invasion or stage uh, and or stage, uh, you know, the returning of Christ. And uh, one of the, the variations of it says that they would use satellites in the sky. And of course, at this point, we can guess artificial intelligence as well as video and audio fakery, deep fakes as, as they're known, uh, to create the, uh, the illusion that there is going to be this alien invasion and that then some people would be shown Jesus in the sky or Buddha or Muhammad or whatever their particular um, faith is. And then all of those different faiths would merge into one new true God that would be there to kind of save us from the aliens. Like I said, there's different variations of it, but generally speaking, this idea that there would be a worldwide calamity using video and audio fakery, using holograms, using artificial intelligence uh, to manipulate people into accepting one world order, that this could be the ultimate, the world's coming together, putting all our differences aside. Finally, we fight off the, you know, and of course, Ronald Reagan has a famous speech of talking about like, if, you know, if we were faced with a threat from beyond our world, then maybe we would put our silly differences aside. You know, I don't, I can't claim to know for certain that that theory is correct, but I'm always reminded of, um, folks may remember uh, Jim Mars, who was a great researcher. He's since passed mm -hmm. away. Uh, Jim, Jim's books were some of the first that really started to wake me up in the early 2010s. And when I got to interview him a few times, uh, he would, every time I posed a question like this, what do you think about Project Bluebeam? What do you think about this? He, he said that, because he's an old school guy, he had a file cabinet. He said that one of his uh, files was a huh file. So when there were certain things that he couldn't quite explain, he, that just made him go, huh. He would just kind of file it away in that and just keep that in the back of his mind. And I kind of always felt that way with Project Bluebeam. Like, can we... There's, there's some skepticism about the origin of that theory, et cetera. But the point is, when you look around at the technology that exists, could it happen? Is it possible? Absolutely, 100%. I believe that the same way they pulled off a pandemic and things, you know, this stage pandemic and stuff like that, they could absolutely stage an alien invasion or the second coming of Christ or whatever. You show some people something weird up in the sky or even just show videos going around the internet and you have the news repeated enough. Uh, before you know it, you have a, um, you know, some sort of prophecy coming true. And we know that many of these people are ready to play on that. You know, they're ready to uh, declare that. And, and again, I think that we are being prepped for with this new mainstream alternative media networks, which are being funded by some shady characters and myself and Whitney and uh, Ryan at T-Lab are, are, are digging into this and, and really trying to see what we can pull out to inform people before it's too late. That network will absolutely use this this idea, as we were talking about earlier, they're already doing this. They're already pitching the idea that we have finally won, that this is the real awakening, that all of, you know, Brett Weinstein and Tulsi Gabbard and Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and all the, even in the Europe, all the, the right-wing heroes, they're embracing Trump and we're starting to win elections and we're fighting back. And then if you add a religious element to that, I mean, that'll mm. take it to a whole new level that these people will not be reachable, I think, at that point. Like if they buy into the idea that Trump or whoever has been literally ordained by their God of choice, it's going to be pretty hard to reach people at that point. I completely agree with you. And I can see that happening. You mentioned Brett Weinstein. Now, obviously his brother, Eric is um, deeply involved with Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel obviously connected back to, to Elon Musk. Um, we looked at Elon Musk. In his background, you have his, I think it was great grandfather or grandfather was head of technocracy or one of the founding members yep. of technocracy. And, 
what I did find out recently in one of these fascinating, I think people need to realize that this does all connect. The oldest Huxley, um, Julian Huxley was there, was cut, tasked with rebranding. I got this from Charlie Robinson, actually. So props to him. Um, rebranding eugenics. And it was transhumanism was the word he used. And then this is where you get Elon Musk coming in. Um and the the shots and the changing of the biological entities and are they connecting us through the internet of bodies? We don't hear any people talking about the internet of bodies anymore, and um, that's kind of faded into the background. But the technology is in people now. Um, where do you think that plays into this kind of whole end times agenda? Because um, to me, it's it's literally like Elon Musk says, we've got to merge man with machine. Um, he's not even hiding that; he's just giving it the excuse of it needs to be done because his mates are making AI too powerful. Yeah. He, he, he proposes the idea that it's inevitable. And this is again, I think where they're trying to pose this false dichotomy of look, Klaus Schwab and the fourth industrial revolution, he wants us to have chips in our clothes and our bodies and everything. And everybody knows that's bad, you know, reject that. That's not something we want. But then Elon is on the other side and say like, look, it's inevitable. But our best case scenario is that we merge with the AI and we fight off the bad guys and this and that. At the end of the day, they're converging to the same place, like you said, to transhumanism. And absolutely, transhumanism is a uh, is based from the eugenics model. Um, and in terms of the Internet of Bodies, and also people might have heard the the term Internet of Bio Nano Things, uh, Internet of Humans, like these are all phrases that are being floated out there and discussed. And essentially that is making us part of, of that grid. And, and I think that definitely those folks who got the shots um, could be a part of that. Um, there's also things, of course, we're being sprayed around the world on a daily basis. People might be familiar with things like smart dust, which has been known about for a decade plus. There are all, all different kinds of ways. And then, of course, they're talking about mRNA in the food, you know, having food as vaccines. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that I think is a deeper part of the agenda. Now, I can't claim to know whether that means at some point they're just going to activate that and everybody around us is going to turn into zombies. Maybe it's already happening. I, I don't know. But I definitely think it's something that we need to be uh, aware of. And this is, of course, why we need to uh, protect ourselves. I mean, I, and I mean, protect ourselves mentally, physically, spiritually, everything we've got, right? I mean, protect ourselves from as much as possible from their poison food and from their poison injections, but also protecting our mind state. I mean, I'll just be real with you, man. I mean, they, they have wrecked my mind the last few days in terms of dealing with these people. I've had to pull back a few times and like remind myself, like get into my prayer, get into my meditation, go on a walk, be outside for a little while, because Part of the fifth generation warfare, part of the uh, the great inversion is also to demoralize those of us who see what's going on, to make us feel increasingly isolated. We're the wrong ones. You guys don't see this is the real awakening. You're black pilled, you're negative, et cetera. And uh, I mean, it's just been mind blowing to see the kind of people who I, I guess naively believed had principles and had values that they were going to hold on to regardless, sell them out now because their favorite content creator or journalist or whatever is embracing uh, the Trump and Musk and the whole that whole unholy union there. So, I mean, it, it, even beyond just what they might try to put in our bodies, it's important that we're protecting ourselves spiritually and mentally here because this is a spiritual war, as I I'm, I'm, know your audience is well aware. And uh, this is just another layer of it. I mean, I think that we, I don't want to say that things are hopeless. I don't think they're ever hopeless. You know, my grandmother used to tell me before she passed away that as long as there's life, there's hope and we're still breathing. There's still hope there and not the fake hopium that they're selling people, but real true, actual hope in human beings and us and our, and our power and our true capabilities to create a better world and to think outside the box that they're trying to put us in. I mean, that's really been my big message is that if people are only thinking in terms of the system that they're giving us and you got to vote your way out of it or you can go be violent and try to you know storm the capital or throw a brick through a building or you can be apathetic and just tune in drop out you know tune out and just not care about the world all of those are dead ends they're okay with that they know how to handle you if you do that but the moment we step away and we say you know what i'm not going to let my brain and my my body and my spirit be put into this box i'm going to think outside that box and try to think how can i help myself how can i help my local community i mean i for me that is the mm -hmm. key is if each of us really start doing that whether you're in the uk you're in mexico us africa western europe asia whatever the, it, the message is still the same 
yes, these are worldwide issues we're dealing with, but each of us can have the most impact in our own communities and our own families and our own neighborhoods, et cetera. And as well as, you know, talking about localization, I like to remind people that the most local we can go is in our own hearts and our own minds. So if we're not dealing with our own trauma, with our own pain and our own issues, what I sometimes call our internal tyrant, our own doubts, fears, insecurities, and limiting beliefs, this system will play on those things. They will they will exploit your insecurities. They will exploit your doubts. They will exploit your trauma if you don't do that work. So at the end of the day, even though we're facing such mag you know, a magnitude of just monumental um, obstacles here, we still do have the power in our own hands. And that is what they are terrified of us recognizing that. So I just want to you know, reemphasize that to anybody hearing this, that we're talking about some very serious situations. Peter Till, the CIA, Incutel, Internet of Bio Nano things, the potential for AI and for this, uh, the, you know, a false messiah to appear if they haven't already. And those are realities that we shouldn't ignore. We shouldn't bury our heads in the sand. And yet we should also recognize that we still do have a lot of power in our hands. I think what you said, um, and thank you for saying that. I mean, you're not the only one who's felt like that recently. Trust me, um, I've had a few conversations like that. And actually, we just put me and Gaz have just put out like a, a WhatsApp comedy podcast that we do. We look at this stuff and really take the Mickey out of it and laugh at it because it's needed. Um, and the latest clip that David uh, Gaz put out today was about people calling us black pilled as well. Um, let's go and have a look at that because it's quite it's funny the way Gaz puts things. He's got wave words. But um, what you were saying, I thank you for saying that. You and and the spiritual war i think when people you say spiritual war people think out there in the heavens but it's, it's in here isn't it it's you it's your spiritual war within yourself of, of doing what you think is right or fading away it's all in inner work i look at taoism I, I have had to look at that a lot recently and one of the things that they say is do your job then walk away just leave it just do your bit Let, and i have to shut the computer walk away and that's really yeah. hard to do in this day and age is is to just let it go don't worry about what people say in response do what you think is right and let it go and just and Taoism really helps me but you'll find your own way obviously you have and you've been a champion for for localization for years and, and all the credit for you for doing that because you're I don't know anyone else who's doing that and and the funny thing is to disconnect and have things local and small in the world is the way that we all need to so, to kind of get past this because we, they want globalization one big blob actually what we need is to be separate from each other to have our own little tribes and actually what sure. they're trying to do through social for artificial intelligence this cloud mind is trying to replicate something that we have already which is our conscience resistance is is our conscience connection is our knowing they're just trying to basically make a fake version of that um to that point, though, I wanted to just talk about the Habadniks because we come back there, and just because I'll, I'll forget about this, but I was looking into them today. So you were talking about this Messiah situation about um, connecting us to to the grid. <clears throat> this is their ultimate goal, by the way. So the Habadniks is actually, I think, off their website. Nevertheless, um, the ultimate goal is the eighth millennium. So when you look at the look at the Lurianic Kabbalah, it goes up to the seventh, which is the, and then the eighth is basically desolation. It's their their year of rest. So the ultimate goal is in the eighth millennium when the physical itself will be refined to the point where the physical world and the great spiritual revelation will be integrated. May we merit the coming of the Moshiach speedily in our days. So that sees so above as below heaven as on earth, but it's also to do with the combination of a man and machine there. There's another type of human. So this in their messianic madness. Now they only interpret that, interpret that anywhere they want, but, um, this really, they do want a different type of human, don't they, um, here? And not just biologically, consciously, spiritually, and to our very essence. Without your freedom and creativity, are you necessarily human anymore? What makes a person human? That's that's a great point. <clears throat> and I think that you're correct that they, uh, these people want to take out that that spirit, that creative essence, that the divine within us, that, um, you know, I believe the creator breathed life into every single one of us and everything on this planet. And that there's, there's that creative, that divine spark that they want to snuff out and they want to replace it with artificial intelligence or transhumanism or making us part of that machine. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley earlier. I mean, we can look to Aldous Huxley's works and, and his books and see exactly like, uh, you can look to the island, of course, Brave New World, and, and see the kind of human that they want, you know, a human that is kind of devoid of creativity, of uh, emotion, and is just can be numbered in a sort of category. You're an omega, you're an alpha, you're this or that. 
that is absolutely what they, what they want. And I think, you know, what you said earlier about uh, kind of reemphasizing the localization, you know, I, years ago, I used to tell people for the good of everyone, focus on yourself. And I kind of feel like that's still the case, right? I mean, we were taught that to take care of yourself is a selfish thing. And we need to think about other people. Sure, that's important, right? Let's, you know, don't be don't be, you know, just an ass to people and, and, and have some kindness about you. But also if we redirect that and we focus again on that healing and focus on that internal uh, world, which is connected to the divine, then we can find our true purpose. And I think that is exactly what they, they want to remove. They don't want us to have a purpose. They don't want us to have um, divinity and that connection. They want us to deny it. They want us to be distracted by everything they throw at us, whether that's the social media and what we were talking about, getting frustrated. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have had to remind myself, like, step away. I've said what I can. I'm not going to reach everybody. I trust in the creator that the people that are meant to hear my work are going to resonate with it. And the people who won't, you know, maybe somebody else will be able to reach them, but I can't take on that responsibility. And I think it's, it's such an important reminder that I'm grateful we're having this conversation because it, it's just planting that seed back in my brain. And I need to remember that as I prepare to go through the rest of my day today. And I know I've got a, a list of notifications of people angry at me for calling this out. And I have to remember, like, I can give into that energy. I can feed into it. And if there's something positive to come out of it, if there's something beneficial, then sure, let's make the time for that. But ultimately, if we find ourselves feeling down, feeling demoralized, if you go from being on the, the phones, the computers, and then you take that negative energy and you redirect it to your loved ones at home, then they're winning. They are winning already because they now are occupying that space in your mind, that space in your heart, and they've turned you away from your real purpose. And I, I, I'm being real that I've had to battle that the last few days. And this is why we are really working on, as I mentioned to you earlier, trying to form this new independent media of alliance of people who still have their heads on straight so that we can come together, we can support each other, we can boost the signal of each other's messages and really try to hold the ground here because I believe that there is this, this great inversion, this false awakening that would really like to clear the table of all the people who really see what's going on and relegate, you know, now finally censor us for good. Take us off the platforms, push us off to the far corners of the internet while everybody else is celebrating. We won, the freedom movement won, the truth movement won, we beat the deep state. Anybody else who opposes that is then going to be seen as the enemy. They're going to be the, the ones who don't get it. No, you might as well just be a leftist Democrat because if you're opposing the truth movement, the freedom movement, the alleged truth and freedom movement that this mainstream alternative media is promoting, Voting, you're now the problem. You're the enemy. You just won't accept that we won. And uh, I think that can go some very dangerous places. So it's important for us to just hold on to that, that space that I think we're all trying to occupy, that I know you're trying to hold in terms of keeping people, you know, thinking about these things logically and critically and not falling for the many, many layers of deception that they're putting in front of us. Yeah, and you're, you're not on your own there. There's, there might be a very few of us. But we do see it. And um, obviously, we're never going to get we're going into their house. They're never going to let us have the stage to tell them that the person who owns this stage is an absolute crook. They're not going to do that. But what Taoism helps me is go, OK, just do your bit because this life is short. I'm not going to be here forever. I want to get to the, my end of days and go, I just did it. I just did my bit. I haven't got any regrets about it. That's what haunts people. So the likes of, and I don't want to use Alex Jones as just an example, but he clearly knows that Trump is only going to do what he did four years or eight years ago. He knows that. Obviously, you'd have to be, you know, you, you would have to be not well in the head not to know that. But these people can't have that night's sleep because they know what they're doing is wrong. You know that when you look at RFK, he's in there with their bad nicks. You know when you look at... Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson's dad, Dick Carlson, was part of the USIA, which was heavily involved with the government's propaganda. Tucker is from that ilk. And I would say, you know, did he get in the CIA? I mean, come on. <laughs> He's certainly doing their job for free. If he might as well get a paycheck. Um, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous to think they're not. You've got the Kabbalah element. Now, I've been told that Tucker isn't a Kabbalist, although he wears the red ring, red bracelet, apparently just to remind himself probably of the cabal um it's so does putin all of these people are surrounded by this messianic madness which is clearly pushing israel towards solomon's temple and towards temple mount and this ai and i can see it and i'm sure i do believe that these other people can see it but do you think that they're just given up because they're tired 
because I don't believe genuinely that they can't see it because it's so blatant. And some people who can't say they can't see it or pretend or, or acting otherwise have been around longer than I have. So what do you yeah. think is going on here? Was it always supposed to play out this way? You've been doing this longer than I have as well. I'd like to get your, your take on that. Yeah, it's it's really tough to to understand what's happening, man. I mean, I can I can speculate. I've had so I I was on Alex Jones's show Infowars back in 2011, 2012, two or three times. But then once I started to be critical of uh, Alex and Infowars during the Trump years, I, I have since got no no interest in bringing me back on the platform. But I did a report uh, in the, the beginning of the Trump administration when Trump was first picked, um, selected. He chose for his energy secretary uh this guy named rick perry who used to be the governor of texas where i'm originally from and rick perry he was a multiple time attendee of the bilderberg group and i actually did a video that's on my website called the silence from info wars is deafening because i compared and contrasted that you can go back and i searched rick perry bilderberg group on infowars.com it's probably still there and you can go back and find articles from 2011 calling out oh rick perry's a traitor he's going to the bilderberg group this and that and then when Trump picks him for energy secretary, not a single mention, no, no discussion of him at all. And there are numerous examples like that to me that just clearly show some kind of bias. And then, you know, in terms of Infowars, I mean, just look at the amount of people that have left. Kurt Nimmo, uh, David Knight, Aaron and Melissa of Truthstream Media. So many people who I think actually do have principles and who stand by them and who could see what was happening. They chose to let to leave or they were forced out. And uh, I think that that's unfortunate. But does that mean, you know, Alex is just chasing the clicks and views? Because I think some people there's probably layers, right? There's the people who are in the know, like you were discussing, who clearly know that they're they're spreading false information. They're spreading uh, false narratives and that they're leading people astray. And then there's others who might be driven by ego and, you know, just whatever they want to be on a winning team. And then there's others who I've seen who, in my view, they realized Hmm. If I talk about Trump all day in a positive way, I get a lot more views than if I don't, you know, and that I think is, again, part of that great inversion. So many people, whether they did so because they're being paid by the CIA or some other intelligence agency, or they're just being a useful idiot and helping the agenda, they went that direction because they could see which way the wind was blowing. And uh, sure enough, I mean, if you and I wanted to to get on the big stages, we probably just need to change our tune and start singing Trump's praises. And we would see the difference in our followers. We would see the difference in our reach and all that stuff. And so I think there's probably multiple motivations. There's absolutely people should not doubt, uh, you know, that there are intelligence networks involved in this. I can't claim to, you know, we're, I don't think we're ever going to find the document that says who's on that list per se. And that's the trouble, right? Because then the other problem with that is we get into this constant bout of she's controlled opposition. He's controlled opposition. And, you know, I've been accused of that. I'm sure you've been accused of that. And that just becomes this circular game of like doubting every person being paranoid. And of course, that serves the same agendas as well. That serves the uh, the deep state, if you will, as well, because we know that their goal is to disrupt, to dissuade us, to delay us, to uh, divide us in any way they can. And so including by putting in conspiracies that they know are not true, but that are going to turn us against each other and having us speculating about this all day. So I absolutely believe there are people who are, um, you know, playing a role, being paid by government agencies. I don't know if we'll ever be able to prove that uh, for certain. And then there's probably others who are just, they want clicks, they want views, they want money, they want to be on the winning team. It, you know, sometimes as beautiful and powerful as us human beings are, sometimes we can be very simple as well. And again, this is what I was saying earlier, that the predator class will, will play on those insecurities and those ego trips and, and the desire to, to win and to be on the, the team that is, uh, is winning things. And I've seen that, how, how important that is for some people where they'll even say, look, I hear what you're saying about Trump. I hear what you're saying about Musk. I hear what you're saying about all these people. But man, it sure feels good to stick it to the libs, stick it to the Democrats. And they're just only motivated by something as childish as that is I want to be on the right team and make fun of the other guys. So I'm going to vote for Trump, even though I know he's funded by Bilderbergers, even though I know he's funded by the Zionists, at least it'll piss off the other team. Like it, it's just there's so many different low primitive levels of thinking that I that I believe this uh, this machine, this predator class is seizing on and is, and is taking advantage of. And then you've uh, that just to find out uh, the, the the other 
side of their own side are funded by the same people people like the Bilderberg group it was was started um by um Prince Bernard was behind it like there is a whole yeah. black nobility edge to this and everybody and people talk about um black rock and vanguard and and where does that no one talks about where the money comes from and how that money gets into black rock and vanguard they're just they're just a corporation a company so like who's behind that where's that money coming from that's where i think i think that a lot of people should be starting to look into but thank you for for your, your time um so what keeps you the very last question and what keeps you going when you're feeling like this because a lot of people out there do listen to to iconic and Kind of do kind of take it down the line. We have some people that, that obviously they're various religions, but in terms of this, they do see the likes of Trump for what they are. They do seem that there's no different from Trump, Harris, Biden. They're all the same. Um, what keeps you going when you feel like you really can't be asked with it anymore? Uh, I mean, honestly, man, I, I don't have any children yet myself, and I, I don't know if I will have children, but I have six nieces and nephews who are 14 and under, and they're really my motivation for the vast majority of this. Like Watching them have to go through witnessing COVID as children and putting masks on and all the insanity, like that is definitely a big part of the motivation that keeps me going every day. Um, and, and then also despite of everything that we're discussing here, I mean, I'm grateful for everything I have. I'm grateful for the breath that I'm taking right now. I'm grateful for the sun shining that I see outside my window right now. I'm grateful for the ability to go on a walk and, and take a break from this or to go, go on a hike in nature and uh, to connect with people like yourself. I mean, I honestly feel like this is exactly why the creator put me here. This is the purpose that I'm supposed to be here for, to connect and work with people like yourself. And nothing else in my life has ever felt as important or as meaningful as doing this kind of work. So despite the the stress that comes along with it sometimes and and just the the true concern for where our world is going uh, i i'm motivated because i believe this is why i'm here yeah one of my favorite book, books is man's search for meaning and you mentioned purpose and meaning there and the, to have a purpose and a meaning is crucial i think for for everybody to to survive you need a reason to get up and go and and to do this for a living I, I feel um, at times when I don't want to do it, I do feel very, very privileged to do this for a living and have at this purpose. There's a reason for it. And that, that in myself is like, I'm useful for one thing. And mm -hmm. I find that I find that keeps me going. There, where can people find your work? And thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Uh, my main website is theconsciousresistance.com. People can find my podcast, my interviews. All of my books are available there to download uh, and purchase. And my documentaries is, are there as well. And if anybody's interested in my documentary series, The Pyramid of Power, it's a 17-part documentary series. We've released 14 episodes so far. The 15th one will be out shortly. And then the 16th and 17th will be coming out very soon. And David uh, David Icke will be featured in the last couple episodes. You can find that at thepyramidofpower.net. Amazing. So guys, head over to the links and um, check out Derek's work. Thank you for your time. Remember to do your own research. Come to your own conclusions. We'll see you in a week's time here on Iconic.com. Okay, goodbye.